So I guess let me begin by thanking the um, everyone who is responsible for, or a good number of the, of the persons who are responsible for making this symposium happen. Uh, so I'd like to note in particular the Faculty of General Education, the VCTA, the VCSA, the Vanier College Student Association, Communications, Bruce Norton and his students for tech support, David Scott, Carlos, uh, oh, oh the, and these are the students, I guess, right? Yeah. Okay, David, oh, excuse me. Uh, David Scott, Carlos Avila, Brandon Calder, student, and also the student and the student development and services office, Maria Grant as well, and the humanities symposium committee, starting first with Lily, who is the organizer and coordinator of this year's symposium. And I just want to express, I guess, on behalf of the, all of the committee, the humanities department, and everyone who's going to be attending an appreciation for all of the hard work you did and the putting together of what is really an excellent uh, week of activities, talks, uh, and uh, opportunities to reflect on this, you know, this topic of boredom. But the committee members are myself, in fact, Lisa Jorgensen, David Kolosic, uh, Caroline Ch uh, Choiska, uh, Sheila Das, and, and of course, Lily. Well, before we, uh, before we proceed, it is important and necessary to mention the fact that, and to remind us all really, and to reflect on the fact that, that we live at, Van we're at Vanier, and so well, we live, we work, and we learn on unceded uh, indigenous lands. Unceded means they were never relinquished. That is never given over to colonial powers or to the Canadian state. This fact is a call to consciousness, to awareness about the circumstances of this complex relationship to land and to territory that we are all embedded in as individuals who live on, on these lands. And that you know, this, this complex relationship makes up our reality. The injustice of the circumstance and the injustices that continue to figure in the reality of land usage and occupation in this ter territory is a call to action. This call to, and in fact, this call to action is one way in which to, um, in which the circumstances of, I'm sorry, the circumstances of possession, ownership, and ownership and dispossession, in fact, links up with the topic of this symposium and the topic of this morning's presentation. Without reducing James Dankert's account of boredom to a single phrase or idea, he tells us in his work, in his book as well, in, uh, that boredom is a call to action. The configuration of land relations in Canada is also a call to action. And I think this, pr this presents us with one interesting way in which to think about boredom as it pertains to us and all who live on the territory of Canada or Turtle Island. So with that, I'd like to move into a introduction of, of James Dankert. He's a professor of psychology at the University of Water, Waterloo, co-author with John Eastwood of the book, Out of My Skull, The Psychology of Boredom, published by Harvard University Press in 2020. He's head of the cognitive neuroscience research area. He leads the Dankert lab at the University of Waterloo. This lab focuses on two main areas of research, one is boredom and the other is bu the building of mental models. Professor Dankert's work on boredom is especially focused on its neurological sources, determinants and effects. Although the book Out of My Skull is a wider examination of boredom, uh, although, although the book Out of My Skull is a wider examination of boredom addressing such things as what boredom is as a state or a feeling, uh, what its implications are for us in everyday life. Notably in the book, the point is made that boredom's implication is that it is a call to action. Today, Professor Dankert will be speaking about his research on the neuroimaging of boredom. So on that note, I would like to turn over the floor to Professor James Dankert, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for that lovely introduction. But I'm gonna to talk to you as Brian pointed out today about the neurological sort of signatures and, and correlates of being bored. 
Now, throughout this symposium, you're going to have a number of different definitions of what boredom is. So the one I like the most comes from Leo Tolstoy in his book, Anna Karenina, and that is he describes ennui as the desire for desires. And as Brian pointed out in his introduction, this really encapsulates for me the notion that boredom is a call to action. When we're bored, we're disengaged from what we're doing right now, but we really want to be doing something that matters to us. We just don't want to do what's currently available to us or currently right in front of us. And that is essentially the conundrum of boredom. And I like this metaphor of pain, which I get from my good friend, uh, Andreas Alpadoru, who you'll also hear from in this symposium. So the analogy with pain is that, you know, the function of pain is not to cause us hurt. It's to galvanize us into action to deal with whatever caused the pain in the first place. And similarly, the function of boredom is not to make us disengaged or to make us feel uncomfortable and restless. The function of boredom is to push us into action, to find something more meaningful or more purposeful to engage in. And those who experience the, the state of boredom more frequently and intensely, we would call sort of high trait boredom proneness. And these individuals, I think that they not only feel the, the state intensely and frequently, but they sometimes fail to respond well to it and make choices that are not really adaptive. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the work of uh, our lab and others who have looked at the neurological signature of boredom in that context of a disengaged attentional state um, and that call to action. So there are three points that I'm gonna try and make in, in this talk. And I'm only gonna go for about half an hour or so. That is to talk about this notion of being attentionally disengaged and to look at the brain networks that are associated with that kind of state. And also in that, when we're bored, we're very much self-focused. We talk about, you know, we would say I'm bored. Uh, and so we, there is also some work suggesting that when we're bored, we ruminate on the fact that we're bored, which is not really that helpful in getting you out of the state. And I'll touch on that a little bit. And then I'll move on to talk about this notion of a call to action. There has been some work suggesting that boredom prone people tend to be high risk takers and a little bit impulsive as well as being sensation seekers. But I wanna show you some work from our lab that suggests they might not be risk takers so much as they're just noisy in their decision-making. They're inconsistent in the way they decide to pursue goals. And the final thing I'll talk about is the notion of reward processing. And here we have the least amount of data, but I think it's uh, an interesting thing to talk about anyway. Um, is it the case that for people who are highly boredom prone that they just have uh, a disrupted or dysfunctional reward system? And that means that it's difficult for them to seek meaning and agency in the things that they do. So we'll start with this notion of being potentially engaged. And I have to start with some talk about how we actually look at the brain so in the early 90s, we first started using functional MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, to look at what um, the activity that's going on inside your head. And to do that, we used a particular design that I'm showing here. This is the very first fMRI study, which had these on-off periods. And the, simply put, the off period was a 60-second period of time where the, the participant had nothing to do. They might have had a screen to look at with a central fixation cross on it, and that would be it. And then for the 60-second on period, they would watch a movie. And so the idea here is that you could contrast the activity in the brain from that off period where nothing was happening to the on period where you had something to do and see what kind of activity was happening in the brain as a function of that contrast. Now, the assumption of those off periods is that whatever thought processes are going on during that 60 seconds of doing nothing is that from one person to the next, they'll be random and they'll cancel one another out as noise. So any differences in terms of gender or sex, any differences in age, or any differences even in the content of your thought will just be so random and so noisy that they'll cancel one another out. You might be thinking about an exam you've got coming up. I might be thinking about a, an appointment I have later in the week. Any number of things that we might have going through our minds during that off period are so different from one another that it's random and it shouldn't matter. But it turns out it's not all random. And so this uh, uh, researcher, Marcus Rakel, had a lot of data that he was able to look at um, where he had these on-off periods. Now the on periods, the tasks that, that people were doing in his studies were very different. They might've been a memory task or a language task or an attention task. It didn't matter. All of the, the off periods where they did nothing, they were all the same. And so Rakel and his students had a look at the brain activity during those off periods. And that's what um, I'm showing you here on this slide is that the, the activity was not in fact random. 
the yellow arrow there and it points to a part of the brain known as the precuneus and the, the orange arrow points to a part of the brain known as the medial prefrontal cortex. And if you look below at the time course of activity in those two brain areas, they're very, very similar to one another. And so they found this network of brain areas that when we're actually supposedly doing nothing, there's no external task for us to focus on, but you see activation in this network of brain areas, a network that he labeled a default mode network. And here you're seeing this activity again, those orange and yellow lines is the same as what I just showed you. But the thing I wanna point out here is that when that network of brain areas for the default mode is active, other parts of the brain and other networks of the brain are showing the opposing patterns. So if you look at the blue line here, and this represents activity in the intraparietal sulcus, that's what IPS stands for, although you don't need to worry about these labels. When the default mode is active, that part of the brain is deactive and vice versa. So when there's activation in the default mode network, other networks that are important for focusing attention or, or um, performing various sorts of tasks become deactivated or downregulated. So what is going on with this default mode network? Well, one of the things that people have found is that when there's no external task to do, we often mind wander. So we let our thoughts just wander from one thing to the next. And those thoughts are sort of an internal reverie, if you like. And so that's a very common finding that people mind wander when the default, when the default mode network is active, that we're seeing sort of mind wandering behavior. And which we, we know from research in our lab and others that when people are bored, they also tend to mind wander and that the highly bored and prone have higher rates of spontaneous mind wandering. But it's not just mind wandering. What you see in the default mode network is also sort of what we would call self-referential thoughts. So you might be thinking about um, uh, events in your past, what we call autobiographical memories. You might be thinking about plans you have for the future. All of those kinds of things that I talked about that might be happening in the off period of an fMRI scan. So the important thing about these thoughts is that they're not task focused because there is no task for you to do, but they are self focused. So you're thinking about yourself when you're having these mind wandering episodes or these default mode activation. So one of the first studies to look at this comes from Martin Ulrich and his colleagues um, who were interested not in boredom, but in a state that might be considered one of boredom's opposites. And that's the state of flow. And flow is this um, intense state of engagement where you're so focused on what you're doing that the rest of the world seems to just fade away. Um, time dilates or constricts, it just doesn't seem to matter. You're impervious to distraction. And it, it's just this intense state of concentration and focus, sometimes that athletes will refer to as being in the zone. And so Ulrich and colleagues were interested in what happens in the brain during that state of flow but of course they need some contrasting conditions. And so they, they chose boredom and overload as their contrasting conditions. The way they did this is they had people do math sums and in the boredom condition, the math sums were just super easy. One plus two, something very, very simple and easy for everyone to do. And that's shown in these red bars with the B underneath it. In the overload condition, the math sums were hard. They were too difficult for most people to do. And the idea there is that you'd be so overloaded uh, and, and unable to do the math task that you wouldn't be able to get into the state of flow. And that's shown in these blue bars with the O underneath it. The green bars represent the flow state where they titrated the math sums to be just right for you so that you had a perfect chance of getting all of the math sums right. And that would get you presumably in none. On the left there, you see some of the brain activity that's associated with being in that state of flow. And we're not there that interested in that, but these are parts of the frontal cortex and the basal ganglia. The, the putamen is part of the basal ganglia. But for our purposes on the right, you can see activation that's higher for when people were bored in that condition where the math sums were just super easy. And you find activity in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is a, a part of that default mode network that I just told you about. And on the bottom there, you also see activity in a part of the brain known as the amygdala. And this part of the brain is responsive to emotional and affective experiences. So when we talk about boredom, we would talk about it being negatively valenced. It doesn't feel good to be bored. And so it's not surprising that we see activity in the uh, amygdala when people are in that sort of boring condition of Ulrich's study. Let's see if I play this uh, video for you now. I'm not sure that the sound will come through. It's coming through on my end. I'll play it just for a couple of seconds. <laughs> 
it would be cruel and unusual for me to play the entire video, but the Ulrich study didn't actually make people bored. They just assumed that the tasks that were easy would be more boring. And so we wanted to directly make people bored. And to do that, one of my students, Colleen Merrifield, created a video of these two guys hanging laundry. And usually when people first start watching this video, they laugh. And I don't know if it's because it's such an unexpected video or if it's because the two guys are doing a really horrible job of hanging laundry. But after about 15 seconds, it's, uh, you can trust me, people get thoroughly bored. And we asked them to watch this movie for eight minutes. And we contrasted the brain activity associated with that eight minutes with brain activity in a resting state. The resting state is just eight minutes of doing nothing. And that uh, um, typically activates the default mode network that I've been talking about. So here's the brain activity that we observed. In that resting state, you get activity in the default mode areas that are, I would expect. So the posterior cingulate and precuneus is in that top brain image. In the bottom brain image, you see that area again in the middle, but the two areas of activation to the sides of the brain are the in, um, inferior parietal cortex, which is also known to be part of the default mode. And not shown here is some activity in the medial prefrontal cortex that we also observed. So that's great, because it's not surprising. We got the default mode network in the same way that everybody who does these kinds of studies finds it. But what did we see when we made people bored with our eight minutes um, video of two guys hanging laundry? Well, it's almost exactly the same brain scan here. You can see the same parts of the brain are active, slightly different amounts and shapes of activation, but exactly the same areas of activation. And the key difference here is that in the resting state, there really is nothing for you to do. But in the boredom condition, we asked you to pay attention to the film, but the film is so mind numbingly boring that you switch off and instead engage this default mode network that we know is involved in mind wandering and self-referential thought. And we had a third condition, and this, in this condition, we let people watch eight minutes of the BBC Blue Planet documentary. And what you're looking at here then is down regulation or deactivation, if you like, of the default mode network. So this was just an important control for us to have to say that when people are interested, they activate different parts of the brain. So if that was all we found, it might be um, not quite so interesting to show that when you're bored, you switch off, and when you switch off and you're disengaged attentionally, that activates the default mode network. But we took a little bit of a closer look at our scans, and we looked at, in particular at a part of the brain known as the anterior insular cortex, which is highlighted here by these white arrows. And you can see in the, in the um, so the anterior insular cortex is very important for representing what we think is behaviorally salient or relevant information. If there's something out there in the world that is important to you, the insular cortex will show increased activation um, relevant to that stimulus. And what you can see in the resting state scan is that there's absolutely nothing going on. There's no upregulation or downregulation of the insular cortex, which makes sense because there's nothing external in the environment of any relevance. In the boredom scan, we find downregulation of the insular cortex. It's like the insular is turning off. And again, there is something in the environment to pay attention to two guys hanging laundry. And yet the insular cortex is saying there's nothing to see here and it just seems to shut off. And again, as our control, when we look at the BBC movie, um, the insular cortex shows increased activation, clearly indicating that there is something interesting to focus attention on. So the functional MRI work I've just showed you shows that the brain when it's bored is sort of um, disengaged attentionally. And when we're disengaged, we show activity in that default mode network. But next we turned to EEG, so electroencephalography, where we can measure electrical potentials at the scalp and we can really um, uh, focus those, that, that study on particular aspects of a task, a task that we think is gonna be important for attention. So the task we used is called a go-no-go -go task. Quite simply, people are shown different letters and numbers and they have to hit a button to everything they see except if it's repeated. So in this instance, when the second um, instance of the letter F is presented, you withhold your response. You, you have the so-called so no-go trial. Um, and this requires you to focus attention. You need to really sustain your attention over time and be vigilant to the appearance of two things in a row so that you can withhold your response. And on the right here, you're seeing topographical maps of electrical potentials in the brain and particular event-related potentials. So the P3 at the top, sometimes called the P300, is known to be important for focusing attention. And you can see that for people who are high in state boredom, so people who really rated this task as being boring, there's a lower peak in that P3 waveform. 
suggesting that they're struggling to focus their attention on the task. Another important thing about this task is that you need to be aware of when you've made an error so that you can sort of be more vigilant next time. And that's what you're looking at on the bottom image there, the error related negativity. And again, the people who reported that the task was thoroughly boring show a lower peak in that ERN, suggesting that they're not even paying attention to those instances when they make an error. So both from the point of view of the fMRI work we've done and the, the work from Ulrich and colleagues and the EEG work, it suggests that there really is um, a, a confirmation of that aspect of boredom, that when we're bored, our attention is disengaged and this neural data seems to support that contention. So I'll move now to this notion of a call to action, as Brian pointed out in his introduction, that we do make this claim in our book that boredom is a self-regulatory signal that is calling us to act, to say, whatever you're doing now is not working, find something else. And in that context, it's worth talking about a series of studies from Timothy Wilson and his group in 2014. What they did is they had people sit in a room with nothing but their thoughts. They took cell phones away. There was no reading material in the room. There was nothing to look at but the bare walls. And they sat, sat people there for 15 minutes. And then at the end of that, they asked them to rate the experience. And about one third of people said that it was quite pleasant, uh, but another one third were ambivalent. And then the final third of their participants said it was really unpleasant and quite boring. But the experiment that I think is most interesting comes from their final experiment in that series. And in, in that experiment, they said, you can sit in the room here with nothing but your thoughts or one option. And the one option is you can administer, a, you can self-administer an electric shock. Now, people in the study had felt the electric shock before their 15 minutes started. They'd all rated the electric shock to be unpleasant and said that they'd pay money not to experience it again. And yet a large proportion of their participants chose to self-administer electric shocks when they had 15 minutes and nothing else to do. One guy shocked himself 196 times in 15 minutes. That goes well beyond curiosity. And so that to me suggests that the human animal is not born to do nothing. I think we prefer to be in a state of action. And when we're bored because we're not able to do anything, um, even choosing actions that might be against your own self-interest or might be maladaptive is something that we will do. And this also casts boredom as a signal of what we call rising opportunity costs. That is anything that you do comes with a cost, a cost of not doing something else, right? So I could choose to read a good book, but that comes at the cost of going and visiting with a friend. Anything that you do comes um, with, um, packaged with that opportunity cost. And so we tested this notion out um, by sort of partially replicating Timothy Wilson's study. And this is just a behavioral study before I get onto more neuroimaging work. And in that, our study, we had two groups of people, one group that sat in a room with nothing to do, but sit with their thoughts for 15 minutes. And in the second group, we had them sit in a room with nothing but their thoughts to entertain themselves. But in that room, we had several things that they could have engaged with had we let them. There was a half finished Lego puzzle that I stole from my son. There was a half finished jigsaw puzzle. There was a tablet that they could have browsed the internet on. So they could see all of these things, but we said you can look, but you can't touch. And then at the end of the experiment, we asked them to rate how boring it was. And it turns out that people in the room where there were activities they could have engaged in had we let them rated that experience to be much more boring than people who were in a room with nothing else in it. So that again sort of confirms this idea that boredom is pushing us to action and when we can see things we could do but we're not allowed to do that um, that, that in sort of exacerbates our boredom. But one of the really interesting things about that study is that many of the people in that study broke the rules. We had a spy camera in the room in the shape of a, a, a coffee mug and we were able to then see that um, whether or not people had obeyed the rules or not. And that says to us that in that circumstance, for many people, the self-control needed to sit there for 15 minutes and do nothing was so challenging and so difficult and so boring that they ended up breaking the rules. And again, this sort of suggests that people who are bored or people who are highly boredom prone might engage in, in actions that are maladaptive or that are, if you, think, if you like, risky for themselves. And we followed that up by collecting some data during the pandemic. And we've actually replicated this data um, recently. And these are now from samples that are separated by a year. So this is not a sort of one-off phenomena that I'm about to tell you about. 
So early on in the pandemic, in April and May we collected of 2020, we collected data from people and we asked about their boredom proneness and we asked about whether or not they would, were adhering to the rules of social distancing. And it turns out that the highly boredom prone tended to break the rules of social distancing more than the low boredom prone. Again, this seems like a high boredom prone individual choosing a, a risky action, an action that's not um, in their own self-interest and certainly not in the self-interest of the community. And this was shown in another group from uh, Germany as well, from Vanya Wolf and colleagues. And as I say, we've just replicated that a year later in, in uh, sort of spring of 2021. So this sort of that notion that when we're bored or for the boredom prone, that we see this sort of increase in risk taking. So we wanted to look at that and see whether or not EEG would be able to help us determine whether or not that is indeed the case. And we use this balloon analog risk task or the BART. It's a fairly simple task. The person is just shown a balloon and they're asked to pump air into the balloon and they choose the number of pumps that they do on a trial by trial basis. But the, the trick here is that if you do too many pumps, the balloon explodes and you get no money. If you pump the balloon up just high enough and it doesn't actually explode, then you win some amount of money and you get some positive feedback from that. And what you're looking at then are the waveforms for high and low boredom prone individuals but down the bottom here. This FP3 is a feedback related P300, again, important for paying attention. And the FRN is a feedback related negativity. And in both waveforms, you can see that the highly boredom prone individual shows a difference in those waveforms, that their lower peak in the FP3 and a higher peak for the FRN. And what this suggests to us is that the, the, the um, choices that are made by high boredom prone people, when we looked at their actual behavior in this task, they didn't pump the balloons up any higher than the low bottom prone. So they weren't objectively making any riskier choices, but they weren't using feedback well. So you need to sort of use the feedback in the task to know what, how many pumps is too many uh, so that you make better decisions on the next trial that you pump the balloon up. But our high bottom prone individuals didn't seem to be uh, paying attention to that feedback as efficiently as you should have. And we followed that up with another behavioral task and this time a sort of fairly explicit gambling task. Here we gave people two decks of cards and you had to choose from, this was done electronically, so they weren't real cards. You had to choose from one deck or the other on a trial by trial basis. And on one condition, both decks would give you a, 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 some amount of a, um, money to win. But one of the decks would give you a small amount of money and the other deck occasionally would give you a large amount of money. So there's really not risk in those two decks because both of them give you some money, but one of them will give you more. Um, and then in the second condition, we had two different decks and these decks now would have sometimes they would give you a win and sometimes they give you a loss. So there was a chance in both decks to lose money. But one of the decks, the wins and losses were infrequent, but they were large. In the other deck, the wins and losses were frequent, but they were small. So the deck with the large wins and the large losses could be considered more risky. And what we found is that uh, overall, the, the high and low boredom prone people didn't make different amounts of risky decisions, but if you split it up by condition, this is what you found. The low boredom prone individuals made more risky choices in the condition where both decks would give you a win. So in some sense, like I said, they're not really that risky, but the low boredom prone people would choose the deck that might give a higher win rate in that condition. And then if you look at those blue symbols for the mixed condition, where sometimes the deck gives you a win and sometimes it gives you a loss, the low boredom prone people were sensitive to that and they lowered the number of risky choices that they made. But if you look now at the orange data points, you can see that from the gains to the mixed condition, the high boredom prone individuals really didn't change their behavior much at all. So they seem to be insensitive to the reward conditions in the task. And we also found that the high boredom prone people switched between decks more frequently. So they were very inconsistent in their decision-making. So again, I think that this highlights the notion of the trouble that high boredom prone people have in focusing attention and using feedback to improve behavior. They're not necessarily more risky in their decisions. They might just be more noisy. So I'll finish now with talking about reward processing. And as I suggested that um, from that last study, you can see that maybe high boredom prone people are insensitive to reward values. Um, but as I said at the start of this presentation, this is the aspect of boredom that we know the least about, at least from a neurological perspective. So this is a really cool study I liked from Del Math and Whitman in 2017. They had people do three different tasks. It doesn't really matter what the tasks were, but they were rated to be a fairly boring task. 
a cognitively demanding task, which was their search task. And then they did a simple preference task. They showed people pictures and asked them, you know, what did you like? And the, the trick then is at the end of each of those tasks, they asked their participants, how much money would you be willing to pay for a music download? Now, the idea was that the more bored you were, the more willing you'd be to pay more money for the music download. And those two graphs on the top show exactly that. So in the boredom condition, people said that they were willing to pay more money for a music download than they were in the other two conditions. And the scatter plot on the right at the top there just shows that changes in boredom were associated with changes in price that you were willing to pay. In the bottom, what you're looking at is activation in the anterior insular cortex. And again, that scatter plot to the right shows a change in activation as a function of a change in the amount of money that you were willing to pay for a download. So I told you before that the insular cortex was about representing something that might be salient or relevant to you in the environment. So in this study, we're seeing upregulation or increased activity in the anterior insular cortex as a function of how desperate people are to get away from being bored. They're so bored by the task, they'll pay lots of money for a music download, and it's the insular cortex that shows increased activation as a function of that desire to stop being bored. So in our hands, when people are watching a boring movie of two guys hanging laundry, the insular cortex shuts off and is downregulated. In Dalmas and Whitman's hands, when people are desperate to get out of being bored and they see an avenue to do so, then the anterior insular cortex is upregulated. I think it's really interesting work and there's a lot more to be done to try and probe that a little bit further. But I started all of my interest in boredom, not with functional imaging work, but in working with people who had had traumatic brain injuries. And the kind of injuries I'm talking about here are what we would call acceleration deceleration injuries. The sort of thing that happens as a function of a car crash, concussions or falls. And what happens in these acceleration deceleration accidents is that the brain shakes around inside the skull. And this causes damage to particular parts of the brain, including a part known as the orbitofrontal cortex. And the orbitofrontal cortex is critical for representing value and reward. So I would work with a number of young men, it was typically young men who'd had these kinds of injuries. And I would ask them, are you more bored now than you were before your brain injury? And to a number, they said yes. And they didn't just say yes, they were excited that somebody had asked the question. So it seemed to me that this kind of injury led to a change in how people rated things as pleasurable or valuable or interesting to them. There'd been a change in the threshold of what matters. And so that's one of the things that got me interested in boredom in the first place. But all of that was anecdotal. You're looking here at a brain from underneath uh, on the left, and that shows that the top part of that image shows the orbitofrontal cortex damaged in an individual who had a traumatic brain injury. But we recently sort of tested this notion in a, in a group of individuals who'd never had any history of brain injury in a group of individuals who'd had a concussion. And this is what we would consider the mild end of traumatic brain injury. And then in a small group of people who'd had moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries. And what we found is that the presence and severity of brain injury did determine boredom proneness levels. So the, the um, people with moderate to severe brain injuries had highest the highest level of boredom proneness. Again, suggesting that that threshold for what is enjoyable or pleasurable or satisfying to an individual has been reset. And I'll finish by talking about this very recent study from Wang and colleagues. A, a lot of what I've talked to you about today has been relevant to the state of boredom. The Dalmas and Whitman study was state boredom. Ulrich's study on flow and boredom is state boredom. Our own study with the two guys hanging laundry is state boredom, those in the moment feelings of boredom. And there's been a sprinkling of, of mentions about trait boredom proneness in the EEG work, but it's harder to do that in MRI because to look at individual differences, you need large numbers of subjects and we don't often have that in fMRI. In this study by Wang and colleagues, they're not looking at function, they're looking at structure. So those blue areas highlighted in the brain are not the brain being active. What they're showing instead is that this particular part of the brain, the precuneus, which is part of that default mode network I talked about, has less gray matter as a function of boredom proneness. So the more boredom prone you are, the less gray matter you have in this particular part of the brain. And we know not only that the precuneus is important in the default mode network, but it is also important in uh, focusing and sustaining attention. So we come full circle to that notion that when we're bored, we have ourselves in a disengaged attentional state. And for the highly boredom prone, that might be because 
this particular part of the default mode network is not as functional as it is in those who are low boredom prone. This is early days, very early days, and needs to be uh, backed up with some replication studies and, and a lot more work, but I find it very interesting. So I hope I've convinced you that when we're bored, we are intentionally disengaged and you see this in activation of the default mode network, even when there's something to look at. You see this in different EEG signals that show that state boredom and trait boredom are associated with um, lower peaks of, of waveforms associated with focusing attention. Showing you that um, at least I think that in some instances, this call to action doesn't necessarily make a boredom prone person more of an impulsive risk taker. I think it just makes them inconsistent decision makers. So then not pursuing goals in a very concerted manner. And then finally, I think that there's a lot more work to be done to try and understand what's happening in the brain with respect to reward processing. It, it's clear that when people are bored, that we are sort of lacking a sense of meaning either for the task at, at hand or more broadly for uh, um, a sense of meaning in our lives. How that pans out in terms of brain activity clearly needs a lot more work. And I'll finish with this quote because it's my favorite and not just because I'm an atheist, but the boredom of God on the seventh day of creation would be a subject for a great poet. And I love this because it suggests that even God on the seventh day, after having created the universe and everything in it, is faced with the same daunting prospect that we are. God has to say, well, what now? And this is casting boredom as a goal pursuit uh, um, uh, process that we are in the, needing something to engage in, needing something to focus on and do, to focus our energies and our skills and talents. And we're not finding that. We're failing to satisfy that need. Um, and, and I think failing to sort of focus our attention appropriately on that need to find something worth engaging in. And so I'll leave you here with this as a list of my collaborators. I'll point out um, in particular, Andrew Strzok and Jotisha Mugon did the study of the empty room with the, the jigsaw, jigsaw puzzles and so on. Colleen Merrifield and Yulia Isachescu did the work on um, the default mode and, and uh, fMRI. And Ophir Jacobi at the bottom there was important for doing all the EEG work. And uh, I, I, Brian had already mentioned that John Eastwood, who you're also going to hear about in this symposium, and I published a book in 2020. You can read that for a broader look at, at, uh, at boredom. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions now. I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, it says new share here. No, stop share. There you go. Happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for that, James. Uh, I guess uh, we ought to clap, even though there are not many of us here. <laughs> No worries. Uh, I don't know if people, I don't, people, people who joined us via Zoom can, can applaud in any, any manner they might. They can either, they're even icon, applaud, applause icons. I, I neglected to mention during the opening remarks, and I suppose that's just uh, on account of, of having a lot of things to think about at once, that there, yes, there will be a question and answer period. And we will take questions both via chat. So if you have questions, please, um, uh, please send them uh, via chat and, and I'll try to, to uh, keep up with those and perhaps Lily will help me as, as they arrive. We'll also take questions from the audience. And if anyone in the audience has a question, uh, you're, I would invite you to come to one of the microphone, to the microphone, I think there's only, there's one here in the aisle and we'll take your question in sequence. I'll just look behind me from time to time or I guess I have to look up there and, and, and see. Uh, now, we have about half an hour uh, for questions. I, I think I may start things off. I don't know if, if there are any, any uh, chat questions yet, but I think I may start things off. I've been thinking a lot about boredom in the weeks leading up to this event, to be honest. And I guess that seems a bit uh, paradoxical in as much as you know, I, you know, being interested in, a, in the topic of not being interested. Yet there's so much to think about uh, when we when we you know when we take account of boredom. I read, poor, I didn't read the entirety of Out of My Skull. I'll, I confess, but I read good portions of it, and uh, I found myself you know uh, asking a number of questions in kind of a, a, a repeated way, which maybe we'll get to, and maybe not. It depends on 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 what on the traffic, uh, the, the question traffic as we proceed. But let me ask a couple that come to mind immediately. One is uh, whether or not, uh, okay, the idea of, of boredom proneness, 
both as you were speaking and when I was reading about your work, left me with the question as to whether or not this is a, a state or a condition that is physio first and foremost physiological. Okay, so I guess somehow explainable by and understood that can be understood causally by some something going on in the brain and or whether or not boredom proneness is a i guess a state that an individual may have that comes from external circumstances or and or and or possibly a combination of both so that's one question is how one becomes boredom prone are you physiologically biologically pro just simply prone to that or are, are there is there is the social circumstance and the social context uh, possibly contributing to that state? Uh, and uh, just another question before I, <laughs> and then I'll leave you to, to proceed with the answers. I, I guess I ought to mention that I'm I'm a sociologist, and so as I was reading and thinking about boredom, I guess I was asking questions that were informed by sociology. And, and as you know, James, I think so psychology and sociology sometimes have a bit of uh, can sometimes meet when they meet, there can sometimes be some degrees of, of tension <laughs> over how to explain human conduct and explain, you know, behavior and so on. Uh, so I'm coming at this a bit from, uh, from the influence of a kind of a sociological outlook. The other thing I want to mention is that uh, the course that I'm teaching that and, and which, um, which is scheduled at this time is a course about risk. In fact, it's called it's a, a kind of an epistemology of risk or an, a consideration of risk and knowledge. So I'd like to ask you a bit to, to address a bit more the relationship between boredom and risk. You, okay, you mentioned something about risk taking and you know boredom proneness and risk taking, and I guess that's one that's that's one way. And I'd like perhaps like to have more of your thoughts about that relationship and whether or not your research is leading to the view that something needs to be done about boredom in order to, I guess, prevent or mitigate people doing risky things that can cause themselves harm, can bring about harmful or unwanted consequences for themselves or for others. Okay, let me leave it there. Let me leave it with those two <laughs> questions. And we'll yeah, there's a, there's, there's a lot Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot in that. So I'll see what, I, I, hopefully I can pull it all apart. The notion of, um, you know, what makes someone boredom prone. So um, I, I, the short answer is I don't know. And, and we would have to do work from, you know, very early on in life to try and figure out um, what those things might be. But it's almost certainly going to be, you know, individual and environment interactions. We are in the process of looking at genetic profiles. So phenotypes um, that, are, that might be associated with boredom proneness. It's not going to be just boredom proneness, in my view, though. It will be something related to self-regulation and poor self-regulation. And so boredom proneness will be a sort of particular species of poor regulation, I think. So we, we do, we're looking at, um, um, we're looking at genome-wide association studies and boredom proneness. And, and, you know, we have, I don't have any data on that yet, but we, we're hopeful that we will soon. And we have done some candidate gene studies where we look at specific genes that are associated with uh, neurodevelopment, so BDNF or brain-derived neurotrophin factor, uh, and also genes that are associated with reward processing, so the dopamine transporter genes. And so we will be looking at the sort of biological aspect of that phenotype of high boredom proneness. Um, from other sort of perspectives, when you're asking about it physiologically, there's been a debate for more than you know, 50 or 60 years about whether or not you should consider boredom to be high or low arousal state. And um, you know, to, to sort of mention my, my colleague and friend, Andreas Alpadoro as well, he wrote a really interesting piece recently to suggest that, that arousal just shouldn't be something that we consider part of the definition of boredom. And I think I agree because we can be bored and restless and we can be bored and, and listless, right? So I think that the physiological signature of boredom is, is not going to necessarily have a clear or clean arousal signature to it. From the point of view of brain imaging, I should point out that most of what I show you here, EEG and fMRI is correlational. So we're really not looking at causation there. And I can't tell you that this brain, uh, um, this, this brain signature is gonna cause you to become boredom prone at some point in your life. Somebody had asked in the chat, you know, can a high boredom prone individual who has this lack, lack of gray matter that I showed you in the very last um, image, can they retrain their brain? Um, potentially, but we don't really know what the best retraining methods would be at this point. 
So there's lots to sort of um, uh, untangle there. Um, and then you're asking about risk taking. So I, th I think that when we do this kind of stuff in psychology, we have to be careful about um, the kinds of measures that we're using. So often we use self-report and self-report fairly consistently shows boredom prone individuals to be high risk takers. And then there's a number of studies from Erin Westgate and her colleagues. She, she can show that when you make people bored, you're more likely to engage in bullying, which is not a risk taking behavior, but certainly a socially uh, um, you know, maladaptive behavior. She's also shown that people can engage in sadistic behaviors. They're more willing to, to tear apart worms when they're bored. Um, and again, this is a socially maladaptive sort of um, and unacceptable sort of behavior, right? So you can show, depending on the measure that you're using, these kinds of maladaptive responses to being bored. And some of those maladaptive responses can look like increased risk taking. What I'm trying to say, I guess, is that it's not always the case. And if you take these sort of gambling measures that we've used, which is you know, not the same as self-report, the high boredom prone people don't take more risks. They're just much more noisy and inconsistent, which comes back to a problem of focusing attention and, and, and feedback. Um, when you get to the sociological part of it, which I have to be you know, um, uh, ignorant of, the notion of whether or not there's something we need to do about it uh, comes back to the work we did in the pandemic, where I think, yes, we would like to have a better way of messaging people who are struggling with self-control and self-regulation so that we can improve their capacity to stick to the rules of social distancing. Um, in, in that context, I think it, it would be about um, trying to, to message people about the why for those kinds of social distancing metrics, but also giving people some sense of their own control over the circumstance, which I think we've all could admit that over the past two years, that's one of the things that's been lacking. We don't have full control over all of our behaviors and that's uncomfortable. It's particularly uncomfortable for the highly boredom prone. Um, and from, a, 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 I guess, another sort of point of view, if you're asking about the sociological or external determinants, yeah, there, there are plenty. And so I do focus on the individual and individual differences. Um, and, you know, there are plenty of external circumstances, monotony and redundancy tend to lead to, to boredom. Um, a lack of control or a lack of that sense of agency tends to lead to boredom. Um, whether or not those things are, uh, you know, um, prevalent in different sort of um, spheres of society or not, I, have, I haven't investigated, but I'd be prepared to believe that they are. Um, and then you also, it also raises an issue that's not really explored much in boredom research yet, and that is sort of interpersonal boredom. You know, how is it that one person is bored by another? So there's lots of questions to ask there. I, I don't know what with the, uh, the psychology, sociology tension, I, I, I'm happy to talk to anybody about this kind of stuff and figure out what insights that might have. But yeah, we don't have a lot um, to say about that. I think there was one thing also in the chat about any insights that we might have for the classroom. Um, and again, there was something I read recently in the 1920s, there was a, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the architects, but they, they designed classrooms. And you might, uh, people of a certain vintage might remember some of these classrooms. The classrooms where the windows for the class were small and they were at the top of the, the walls. And so children were sitting in classrooms and they were unable to look out the window. And that was thought to be a good thing because then that would avoid them being distracted and having their minds wander. Um, but I suspect that it also made them more bored. So again, in that classroom and insights for teachers, there, there is a, a lot of work from Reinhard Peckrun and his colleagues in, in uh, Germany that shows that students get bored when they feel like the thing that they're doing lacks meaning and they have low control over how to engage with it. So if you can imbue the task with some sense of meaning for them and you can give them some autonomy and sense of control, then you'll keep boredom um, at a minimum. There's another question here that says, why two people are, are doing the same thing but, and one might feel bored and one might feel the opposite. Um, there was the same sort of question for happiness, right? What makes me bored won't not make you bored, but what makes me happy won't necessarily make you happy either. Um, those things, the content of, of our engagement is kind of irrelevant in some sense. You know, you might really enjoy um, you know, bungee jumping because you like the thrill of it. And I might really enjoy stamp collecting. It doesn't, what it is that we engage with is less important than the fact that we chose to engage with it. Okay, there, there seem to be a few other questions. I don't know, I guess you're seeing them then, uh, James. I wasn't aware that that I was can, the case, but- I can see the chat, see. yeah. There's one, oh you, oh, you can, okay. So uh, this, there's one that 
this one wasn't uh, addressed yet, right? Are there different results? Okay, if the individuals are self-aware of their mm -hmm. brain activity when bored, mm, interesting, yeah. There's some, if you there's know, some, if you, if you, if we, yeah. there is some work out there Go trying ahead, to use please. sort of, uh, some work out there trying to use sort of biofeedback, right? So if I show you your brain activity in an MRI scan, you know, can you then modify that brain activity by your own will? Um, uh, um, so some of that work coming out of the Netherlands. Um, I don't, it hasn't been done with uh, boredom prone individuals, but it, there is work that John Eastwood and his colleagues have done showing it's sort of a, a lack of self-awareness in, in that boredom prone people tend to experience higher levels of what's known as alexithymia, a difficulty in labeling your emotions, right? A difficulty in sort of saying, I'm feeling this now. And I think if you, if you reflect a little bit on episodes of your own boredom, that it's not, you know, that's, that's not hard to believe that when we're bored, we know that we're bored, but we don't really know why. And we, you know, we don't really reflect deeply on, on what it is that makes this current situation boring and so on. So I think, although I don't know that there's a lot of data out there about self-awareness and certainly no data about self-awareness of your, your you know, neural activity, um, I do think that the highly boredom prone probably will be less self-aware than, than others. Thank you. Okay, so here's one. Uh, is, it, is it also possible that people who are in car crashes are already prone to taking more risk? Would that have an impact on boredom proneness? Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a classic and, yeah. and very challenging question in working with traumatic brain injured patients because they tend to get their brains injured in circumstances that were higher risk or with behaviors that were higher risk, right? Um, so that's a great question. And it's a, a perennial problem with that sort of research, because what we want to know is what was the person like before their, their brain injury. One of the ways to get around that is to not ask the person themselves, as I did when I was um, uh, interviewing and working with those patients, but to ask their caregivers you know, or their family members. So you ask a, a parent or a sibling, you know, what was their behavior like before their brain injury? It's not perfect, but it gives you some sense of whether or not they were high risk takers before they had their brain injury. Um, and there's probably some suggestion that that is the case. Uh, but what we're, we're trying to claim now is that even so, um, their, their own self-report of you know, how their, their life is going now after their brain injury is that they're more bored than they were beforehand. Um, so yeah, there are challenges with doing that kind, making that kind of assessment. Um, and it's a great question. Um, it's a very difficult one to overcome uh, because it's, it's very hard to get a measure of how a person was before they had a brain injury when the first time you see them is after their brain injury. But as what you point, what your research pointed out in respect of concussions and, and brain injury is that people who suffer those kinds of injuries become, uh, tend to experience circumstances of boredom or that equate to boredom to a higher degree, I guess, right? To a higher degree than, than average. You can't compare, yes, it's not possible to compare what they, what they were like prior to the brain injury. And I guess asking them, is, asking them that question is not a necessarily a good indicator that there was a difference, but your work has shown that one of the effects, one of the consequences of those kinds of injuries is this sensation, I guess, or this feeling, this sense that well, those various kinds of affective, affective senses and cognitive senses whereby that correlate with boredom. So the, the risk-taking part of that, I mean, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know that, that boredom, based on your research, boredom proneness, you said, doesn't necessarily correlate with increased risk-taking. Or does it, or, or was that? Well, well, so the, it, the fact that someone... Go ahead, sorry. So, well, so you know, it, there are some studies showing that it does indeed correlate with risk taking, but under self report conditions. But if you actually put them in a task that could involve risk taking, at least the tasks that we used, it doesn't appear to be that the high boredom prone people engage in more risk taking behaviors. They're just, they're just noisier, they're just less consistent. <clears throat> Pardon me. They're just less consistent in their decision making. But that doesn't mean, you know, in any given study, we don't test every single possible behavior and action. So it's, I'm, I'm quite prepared to believe that 
in some circumstances, the boredom prone individual is a noisy, inconsistent decision maker. And in other circumstances, perhaps more real world, real life circumstances, that they are more impulsive and, and higher risk taking. And so trying to understand what are the circumstances and contingencies that lead to those differences is an, an important question. Are there any other I have a question from Sheila. Okay, so I'll have a question here. I'll read it out. The reason why people who had an injury of the cortex are more prone to boredom is it because the motor part of the cerebral cortex is damaged? Um, so typically in the traumatic brain injury um, setting, so as I suggested, you brain gets shaken around inside your head and the part of the brain that gets injured most directly is the orbitofrontal cortex. Orbito, because it's above your orbits, your eyes, um, and at the front of your brain. Um, many times uh, um, th these individuals won't have motor control problems because the motor cortex or the motor strip is um, more posterior to that. It's, it's, it's a further back. Um, and so uh, you, may, you may be knowing from your own experience, people have had brain injuries, acquired brain injuries, which is a slightly different than a traumatic brain injury. Um, acquired brain injuries that do have motor problems, particularly as a consequence of stroke, you'll see people with motor control problems quite commonly. But these acceleration, deceleration injuries don't often lead to, you know, they have to be quite severe. Um, and they, you know, it, it depends. The mechanisms are quite varied. But um, the people that I saw didn't have any motor control problems. Thank you. By the way, if anyone wants to ask a question from the audience, uh, please, I'll turn around. I haven't been turning around, but I will again. Uh, but there is another question in the chat here, which hasn't been posed yet. So would you say it's possible that boredom may be hereditary? That picks up on some of some uh, question I asked earlier and, so, and, and part of your answer, but we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll proceed again. This, uh, that, possibly, that possibly people whose parents are more bored uh, maybe more prone to boredom. Okay, so this is a question that goes back to some of what we were talking about, what you were mentioning earlier about studies on, I guess, genetic inheritance or inheritance of particular genes that may contribute towards that. Yeah, I, I think one of the, so, so I'm in the process of doing some work with a colleague, uh, Marla Sokolovsky at the University of Toronto, and she's an evolutionary biologist. And so she works, at the, the species she works with is Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. But she sees two phenotypes in that fruit fly. Phenotypes she calls the rover and the sitter. The rover um, fruit fly tends to explore its environment more widely and has high risk tolerance. The sitter fruit fly tends to explore more um, carefully and has a low risk tolerance. And we showed um, that that phenotype is actually preserved in humans. Um, so quite phylogenetically dif distant species. Um, where the, the distinction that we make in self-regulation is between locomotion, this is a, a person who likes to move from one action state to the next quite rapidly, so they sound a lot like rovers, and assessment, and this is a person who prefers to pause and think about all the options for action to make sure that they choose the right one, and that sounds a little bit more like the, the risk intolerant sitter, and we find that on a, a gene um, that, that is sort of known to be the, uh, a foraging gene of sort of a behavioral gene associated with the fruit flies that Marla works with, we see that phenotype in humans. So all that to say is that that is our first foray into looking at self-regulation and boredom and, and genetic phenotypes. And we're pursuing that um, again. Um, but in all of that, I don't think anybody ever now talks about heritability as a sort of nature nurture debate. I don't think that that debate really exists anymore. So instead in sort of evolutionary and behavioral genetics, we talk about gene environment interactions. So we're gonna collect a lot of this data and have a look at the genome wide associations with boredom proneness, but we also need to take into account some other kinds of environmental factors. And then we take into account demographic factors like sex, gender, age, um, but we'll also take into account socioeconomic status. I don't think there's any data out there suggesting that boredom is affected by your SES, but we need to sort of look to, to see that. And if we had all kinds of time and all kinds of money, we would do a broader look at what the environmental contingencies might be. Do, do early life traumas have an effect? We know they, they have an effect on depression. Do they also have an effect on boredom proneness? So it's a long winded answer, but the idea is that yes, there will be some heritability as there is for just about every behavior, but it's not going to be solely genetically determined, it's going to be a gene environment interaction 
of some degree of complexity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm wondering, I, I, what would you, what would you might you say about the, what you, the age-specific correlates of boredom? In the book, you do address that question. You know, which age groups seem to be, in which age groups is there a greater degree of likelihood that one would feel bored? I find that to be a very interesting question, the one that's really, I think, relevant to an educational context as well, since the. The the uh, I guess a certain way a certain belief about being bored is sometimes sometimes circulates within educational contexts uh, sometimes on the part of students sometimes on the part of others but um, so what can we say what can we what can we say about the the, the age correlate between uh, the the correlation between age and feeling bored yeah we don't we don't have a lot of great data on very young kids so we don't have a very good data from you know naught to to 10 or 12 years of age we do have some data um you know uh, other labs and, and some of uh, of our own data on preteens and teenagers and that data fairly consistently shows that boredom is rising throughout those early preteen and teenage years um and elizabeth waybright just published a study uh 2020 i think showing that Indeed, boredom in 10th, 11th, and 12th graders is increasing over time too. So it's you know they, they followed people longitudinally, which is a, a great thing to be able to do, um, and and they showed that boredom was getting worse over the last sort of decade of of um, of measuring it. Um, oh, they they did sort of half a decade, I guess. Um, so it rises through the teenage years. It's been rising recently in time, and that's an interesting thing to wonder about why that might be the case as well. Around about the late teens, early 20s, we start to see that it dips, it drops. And that part is really crucial. That, that age range is crucial because in our late teens and our early 20s, we're getting the final stages of neural maturation. So the, the, the nerve fibers that you have in your brain um, get coated with a substance known as myelin. And myelin is very important for making the electrical signals in your brain efficient, right? And the last part of your brain to get fully myelinated is the frontal cortex, that, that, that part of your brain that's really important for all of our most sophisticated behaviors, decision-making, judgment, you know, uh, socially appropriate behaving, these kinds of things depend very, um, very much on the frontal cortex. And so at that time where the frontal cortex is maturing and you're getting better self-regulatory skills, we see a drop in boredom proneness. And then if you measure it through um, later decades, it continues to drop into the 40s and 50s. And part of that is probably because we all start to have less time to be bored, right? We, we get kids and mortgages and jobs and, and there's you know, all these sorts of responsibilities that really don't leave a lot of time for boredom. And then in the later decades, we see a rise in boredom in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And that might be, that, that has been shown in some studies to be related to social networks. And I'm not talking about Facebook, I'm talking about connectedness with other people in your life. The better your social network, the less bored you are in your sixth and seventh, eighth decades. So for those people who are experiencing loneliness in those, those later years of life, they tend also to be a little bit more boredom prone. Um, so, so yeah, boredom does change as a, as a, uh, a facet of, of age and circumstance. Thank you very much for that. We have about five minutes remaining. So let's see if there are any new chat questions. And there's some, I'm sorry, there's a Q question here. Yes, okay. Do you see it, James, or shall I, I guess- oh, That's in Q&A, yes. Um, so, yeah. oh, it's Busra. Oh, it's in Q&A, oh. So, uh, Busra is asking about yeah, so depression and boredom. Um, is there a connection or causality between the two, um, boredom and depression? And does boredom turn into depression or vice versa? Um, I'm curious about this relation to work and boredom, people bored with their jobs, people who quit their job on account of being bored and depressed by work. Thanks for that, Busra. Um, <clears throat> there is this notion that came uh, from some Scandinavian um, journalists, I think, talking about bore out. So we've talked a lot about um, in our culture about burnout, right? So that you get so stressed at work that you get burnt out and you, you have to quit your job. Well, these guys were putting forward this idea that people can get bored out. So that the job is so easy, so repetitive, so monotonous that they get so bored that again, it leads to stress because it's stressful to be doing nothing that's interesting to you and they end up quitting their jobs. Um, so that can certainly happen. Um, 
the relationship between boredom and depression is a complex one. We've known about it. I, I call it a ground zero finding. Like ever since people started investigating boredom, we've known that it's associated with depression, but that's a correlation. In our hands, that correlation is anywhere from sort of 0.35 to 0.7. So it's a sort of moderate to strong correlation. Um, and we, we're in the process of, of putting forward a grant to try and look at that on a causal way to try and understand, does boredom precede depression? There are some hints that it does. So uh, John Eastwood did some work with um, patients who were hospitalized with depression and they reported being afraid of boredom and reported saying that when a boredom episode would come on, that they saw it as a harbinger of depression. That's sort of anecdotal, so it's not ideal evidence. Um, we do have some longitudinal evidence that um, boredom at time one does sort of pre um, predict higher levels of depressive symptoms at time two in an undergraduate sample. So it does seem that boredom comes first. But I think that we need to do a lot more work to confirm whether or not that's the case. And I think the key thing for both is this notion of disengagement from your environment or your world around you. And what, in my view, is happening is that when we're bored, we're disengaged and we blame the world. We say the world is not enough. The things external to me are not good enough. They're not satisfying enough. And somehow when we become depressed, we turn that inward. We say, I am not enough. Um, and so what leads that trigger? What, what is the thing that turns it from an external evaluation to an internal evaluation? I don't have a good answer to that, but I think it's a really important one for us to focus on. Because also beyond depression, boredom is associated with a raft of other mental health challenges. So increased anxiety, increased aggression, um, increased problems with drug and alcohols, drugs and alcohol. So um, we need to understand that causal link a lot better, but we haven't really done the work just yet. Um, so my suspicion though, is that boredom comes first and at some point chronic boredom turns from an external evaluation to an internal evaluation. Thank you very much for that. In the remaining minutes, can we just return to the uh, matter of boredom as a call to action and your and the, 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 the discussion uh, in your talk and also more so in the book about the relationship between boredom and agency. I think it leads to the question as to whether or not, well, what should be done about boredom? Because it seems that it has the potential to result in some kinds of, I don't know, I guess creative types of engagements, I think. If it's, if it's a call to action, how do, we, how do we make sure that if we are in a state of boredom, for instance, we can turn it into an expression of agency that produces something in the world that is productive, not only for oneself, but per, perhaps productive more broadly. Any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so that's a $64,000 question, right? And I think you're gonna be hearing from Sandy Mann who um, would like to suggest that boredom can make you creative. I'm not so sure I'm convinced that it can make you creative, but I am willing to sort of uh, believe that um, when we're bored, we could turn. It's, it's, not, it's not inevitable that we turn to a, a maladaptive action. And many people who foster creative outlets do indeed turn to those outlets when they're bored. And that's a very positive way to do it. Um, Heather Lynch and, and Shane Bench published an article in 2019 showing that um, people would sometimes turn to negative um, stimuli when they're bored. So um, these were pictures that they used that were normally rated as, as you know, unpleasant to look at. But what they really showed was that you will turn to those negative images if the last thing that you did that bored you was positive. You would turn to positive images if the last thing that bored you was negative. So there's a huge influence of context here, right? Um, but what you're asking is, you know, what could we as a society do about it, either for individuals on a, or on a broader kind of sense? I do think that we want to try and help people restore a sense of agency. And the idea then is to first not succumb to the restlessness that is so often accompanies being bored, to try and sort of take a deep breath, calm down from, from the boredom and, and instead reflect on what it means to you. Because I think often what we don't do is that reflective part. We don't reflect on why am I bored right now? And we don't reflect often on what matters most to me? What are my goals in life? We tend to sort of just move from one thing to the next because we're in a bit of a rat race. So taking that time to pause and to reflect, I think is a good thing. But ultimately to answer your question, we need more research. We need, I don't know what the best sort of um, treatment or intervention strategy is for boredom or boredom proneness. 
a lot of people have been um, wanting to turn to things like mindfulness meditation, but I suspect that for the boredom prone, that's just setting people up for failure because mindfulness meditation requires focused attention. And that's something that the boredom prone are particularly bad at. So I don't know that it will work for them. Um, but so I don't have a lot of great answers for you, Ryan. I think that uh, we just need to do, the, if we can understand boredom better, and we're getting a lot closer to that, I think, um, then we can start thinking about what the best interventions might be. Thank you. No, those were great answers, <laughs> James. Thank you very much. We, look, we've run out of time. There were a few more questions, but I'm, I'm sorry, I have to apologize. I appropriated the last few minutes. Um, and uh, we, do, we won't be able to get to those, the, the remaining two questions. So at this point, I want to just uh, express uh, gratitude, immense thanks for your, your uh, participation this morning and launching the, uh, this year's High Humanities Symposium. Many thanks for your illuminating talk and a great way to start off, I think, the discussion and the reflections that we'll be, that we'll be uh, pursuing and following us throughout the week. So thank you very much, James. Thanks to everyone who is in attendance. And uh, thank you. Yes. My pleasure. Yeah. No problem. Thank you for inviting me.